So I'm uh, George Church, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and investigator in the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. We work on uh, advanced technologies for reading and writing in DNA and, and neuronal systems, aging and so forth. We have uh, many new things that we hope to tell you in June 2013 and uh, really looking forward to seeing you there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you at uh, Global Futures 2045 in New York Lincoln Center in uh, June 2013. Right now we back up human brains by education. Basically I try to teach my students and it's a very poor, it's a very slow process and it's a very poor copy. It's nothing like what we consider a, a good copy of a computer. Um, Cloning uh, of people, even if it were done, which it isn't, uh, would not copy any of that information. So it re really, the question is how do we copy it? Do we copy it to purely inorganic systems? Do we copy it to hybrid systems? You know, the most likely uh, backup would be, you know, a, a complete three-dimensional reconstruction of, of a brain um, rather than trying to translate it into a silicon. That's not to say that it's impossible or even difficult to, to completely transpose it, translate it into a, into a foreign substrate. It's just that probably in terms of rapidity of, of change, uh, we'll get coarse uh, grain uh, or, or sampling of, of the brain into electronic uh, systems. And, uh, but to actually produce the kind of very high level thought uh, the out-of-the-box thinking that produces new inventions and uh, new works of art and, uh, and brilliant insights um, may not be our swift, our swiftest move may not be to a purely silicon-based system. In terms of enhancement, what we consider enhancement changes from time to time. Uh, it, um, lo you know, long ago, uh, a, a tractor would be an incredible enhancement to my physical abilities. Uh, you know, a car and a jet certainly is. Um, but as we become, in a certain sense, less and less physical as a society, uh, we're looking for things that help us keep track of our information, to allow us to reason on a larger set of things simultaneously. The, the human brain, most human brains are, have trouble thinking of more than seven, keeping seven things in their head at a time, and they have trouble, uh, you know, remembering more than a, a few new bits of information per second. Uh, for long periods of time. So, so ability to compute on larger sets of things, but with the human ability to think out of the box and to think um, uh, inventively, I think, uh, is, is already happening. I mean, uh, it's just that right now the, the bottleneck is no longer our storage and search systems, which are actually quite good. Um, it's our ability to uh, think creatively about multiple of, of the results from that search uh, on multiple things at once, and that it's a little hard to predict, them, but that, that seems to be on, on a very steep exponential curve right now in a very positive way. I'm very optimistic that we will get much better at life extension, partly because we're now studying the, the genomic differences of extreme individuals, such as people who live past 110 years old. We'll learn all the tricks that, that are present in their genomes uh, soon, within years. Um, once we start we're getting better at replacing body parts. We'll get better and better at making, um, using synthetic biology to make organs. But as you do that, I mean, in a certain sense, every organ in your body can, is replaceable at some level, except your brain. And so your aging brain will be our biggest problem. The, providing support systems for the rest of your body does not solve the problem that your, that your brain is getting Alzheimer's or that your brain, the best way to solve, prevent your brain from getting Alzheimer's is to figure out why some people never get Alzheimer's and to inject those genes into your brain. Um, but then there are other aging processes. Um, we're getting much better at gene therapy. We now have 80 gene therapies um, in clinical trials. Some of those work on post-mitotic cells like muscles and nerves. Um, if we get to the point where we can reprogram the, the neuronal cell body, um, then we can uh, retain all the connections of the neurons um, that have built up over a lifetime of experiences, just rejuvenating the central processor, the nucleus of the, of the cell, 
And, uh, and you can think of it in the same way that we're kind of updating the genetic and epigenetic information the same way we might update the blood flow, taking away waste and bringing in food every, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. This will be something that would you'd be doing to the kind of the information molecules of the, of the cell nucleus. Um, it, it, I think the main advantage of hooking up each neuron to some uh, electronic system or some other molecular computing system that's not neuronal is so that we can understand it better and start um, interfacing with brain-to-brain uh, -brain and brain-to-internet. Not so much for uh, uh, extending longevity. That, there you have to figure out how to s maintain the longevity of the, of the brain, which I think is actually a harder problem than uh, replacing parts. Uh, kidneys, arms. The international mega projects like Brain Activity Map uh, or uh, Extended Brain Computer Interface are, are still extremely important, even if it doesn't necessarily give us the simplest route to aging. Uh, it does, it, it is arguable that a huge fraction of our um, uh, e economics and uh, both on the positive and negative side of, of economics is due to um, problems with um, uh, psychiatric disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, education, all sorts of things having to do with, with, uh, with the brain. So it will be a revolution in, in human society uh, when we uh, have better um, uh, health care, that, that focused on um, brain behavior, psychiatric disorders, um, as well as new opportunities for education and thought augmenting the ways, the particular ways that we think. The whole idea of Darwinian evolu neo Darwinian evolution being limited to DNA evolution is is already um, outdated. Uh, we we are a hybrid system. We're much more of a hybrid system than any other plant or animal on the planet, um, and uh, that is to say that we judge our ability to, uh, to change our abilities uh, themselves um, for hybrids. Uh, in other words, my, my daughter inherits my computing, my c computer uh, literacy, uh, and uh, she inherits um, the uh, standard of living in, in, in a general sense, which is not limited to DNA. And, and our non-DNA component of our human evolution is already going faster than our DNA component. The internet inheritance is going faster, and, it's, and, and a biologist would say it's, it's propagating horizontally, vertically being through the child relationship, which is happening. The child is inheriting my inorganic components. but it's, Horizontally, if I have a good idea, it can spread throughout the internet very quickly. So I think that that's just all that's accelerating. We're we are getting uh, there's no particular uh, limit to how quickly we can evolve because we're no longer limited to DNA and the vertical transmission. To some extent, we're I'm already using avatars. Uh, this this video is an avatar. Uh, I think the main advantage that I see in the short term is, is less travel. Um, if we get a realistic enough representation of, of me, if I can go and inspect a site uh, and the site and people at the site can inspect me, uh, then that eliminates the energy costs and the health consequences of travel. Uh, that's a big plus. That seems rather prosaic and limited compared to having a, you know, a clone of me. Uh, which would also be nice, a backup of me. But I, th I think it's a major um, economic milestone that, that, that we will reach. And every time that there is uh, a pandemic or some other outbreak, terrorism or so forth, uh, there will be an increase in interest in, in the ability to, to, to have the moral equivalent of travel um, without having to move. Uh, there will be other advantages where I might be able to participate in two events simultaneously, which again is very difficult to do if we require my physical body to move around. So I think these things are, are really shouldn't even be particularly um, controversial. I mean, really, it, it, it would be great if I could be at you know a, a meeting in, th 
in uh, you know 12 different time zones, uh, and and not get exhausted. Uh, and uh, it should be uncontroversial that the the saving of energy and the saving of of, of, of lives due to um, not spreading diseases the way we right now. If we had a truly uh, uh, aggressive respiratory illness uh, that spread through uh, airplane travel, uh, you know, we, we would regret just how much air travel we do right now as a species. So I think all of those are positive and uncontroversial. Uh, if I could learn faster, that would be another huge advantage to me. Or, or, or think more clearly. If we do uh, hypothetically gain the ability to transfer um, our knowledge and uh, being, in a certain sense, our, our personality to another biological or hybrid uh, entity, device, person. Uh, what will immediately happen is you'll have two copies of yourself. It won't be like having twins. It'll be much more intimate than that. And the, each of you will ideally feel like you're the, the original. Uh, I mean, if you've really done a good copying job, uh, then you'll feel like it. Now, the telepresence illusion will disappear as soon as, let's say, one of them is dying. Uh, then you have to kind of convince yourself that the second one is an adequate representation. Uh, you don't want to have a bad clone of yourself floating around. Uh, and I think this will be a, you know, a major, it will require a major set of demonstrations, the same way that Food and Drug Administration requires that a drug prove that it's efficacious and not uh, hazardous. You're going to have to do the same thing for any kind of autonomous telepresence or avatar. If it, the more autonomous it is, the more you need to prove that it actually is an accurate representation of you. Faith and tradition are important components of personality. They're important components of who we are. So if we want to accurately reflect that, we need to take them very seriously. Uh, to some extent, uh, faith and tradition act as a buffer, as a, as a, a means of, of carefully guiding the future, not rushing into things that could be bad for us as a society. We want to accurately reflect faith and tradition uh, that varies from person to person. Even the most scientific people have a whole variety of things that they may or may not want to call faith, but it does involve leaps that are not evidentiary in their lifetime or in their hands. Uh, so the question, and, and to some extent, one of the vetting mechanisms, one of the ways, one of the things we want to do uh, with new technology is to show that they accurately reflect the nuances of, uh, of our sentiments, of our ethics, of our uh, policy making, our highest decision making levels. And so we will be asking of of all our avatars, the, the autonomous ones, whether they, uh, you know, think the same way we do about um, articles of faith and articles of, uh, of uh, decision making that, that are based in part on faith.